Good morning and welcome to Charleston Baptist Church. We are so glad you are worshiping with us today. At this time, we ask that you direct your attention to the video screens for this week's highlighted announcements. The beginning of April signals the beginning of our mission and prayer focus for the month of April, which is the Love God Serve Mission Initiative. There are many opportunities on campus and off campus to serve others and share God's love. Please be in prayer about where you or your life group can serve during this month and in the months to come. We hope you are making plans to participate and invite your neighbors to the egg hunt and upcoming Easter services here at Charleston Baptist Church. The egg hunt will take place this Saturday, April 9th, rain or shine at 11 a.m. sharp. If you plan to participate, be sure to pre-register for a speedy check-in process on the day of the event. Our Easter services are just around the corner as well. We have invite cards located around campus that you can share with neighbors, family, and friends. The egg hunt info is located on one side of the card and our Easter services are located on the other. Please take as many as you need. Would you like to have coffee available on Sunday mornings? We are now looking for individuals or life groups that would be willing to serve on the coffee hospitality team on a rotational basis. If you are interested, please send a message to Pastor Jason or stop by the Next Steps desk following the service. And once again, we welcome you to Charleston Baptist Church. If you are a first time guest, we would love to connect with you. We invite you to stop by the Next Steps desk by the Lighthouse after the service so that we can meet you and give you a welcome gift. And that is all of our highlighted announcements this week. Our worship service will begin shortly. We hope you have a blessed week and pray that we will see you again next Sunday, if not before.
as we say. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. Your Father, we just love you, Lord. Lord, we come before you today with hearts of gratitude for your goodness, Lord. Lord, we do want to encounter you in a real and mighty way today, Lord. So, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that you would just uh, remove all the things, in the Lord, that maybe we've come in here today with, with the stresses or the, the burdens or the things that, we're, that are occupying our minds, Lord. I pray that our minds would be occupied, Lord, with one thing today, Lord, and that's that they would be focused on you. So, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful time of worship you've given us today. Lord, I pray that we never would take that for granted, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time, time that we can just lift our voices to you. May it bring honor to your name. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's
sing together. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Of him. 
Amen. It's so good to be here this morning. I'm glad you're able to be here on campus and those joining with us online. It is the month of April, and that brings good things to, for many reasons, but one of the great blessings that we have as a body of Christ here at Charleston Baptist Church is it's a, an emphasis of love God serve, that we want to serve our community. And it's an important time for us because at the end of this month of April, April 24th, we are going to celebrate our 38th year as a church family here at Charleston Baptist Church. And for that, we are very, very thankful. And part of the blessings of being the body of Christ is to not only serve one another, but also to serve our community. And so throughout the month of April, we are encouraging our church family uh, through life groups, uh, through uh, individuals and families to, to find ways that God has pressed on us uh, to serve our community. And I, I just want to ask ourselves to just go before the Lord and pause for just a moment and say, God, what is it that you've put before me? How have you opened up my eyes uh, for the community that I live in? How can I love them, serve them, live with them, meet with them, spend time with them? If there's a need that you see that, that you can help provide, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, we want to uh, allow our life groups to be a part of that too because part of living life together is to serve together. Uh, one of the greatest blessings that you'll find in your life group, not only being under the word of God and building relationships within your life group, but it's serving together. And so we want to encourage our life groups to be a part of that. If you have any questions about uh, Love God Serve or ways that you can help serve our community, I would encourage you to go to our next step uh, area right after our church service today, uh, or you can reach out to Pastor Jason, uh, Jason at charlestonbaptist.org, and he would love to give you some more insight and ways that we can serve our community. But what a tremendous blessing it is, and just everything building up to that last Sunday in April where we celebrate uh, the life of, of the church here at Charleston Baptist Church. I also want to encourage everyone that next Saturday, uh, April the 9th, we are opening up our campus in a way that we uh, don't normally do on the weekends uh, for our Easter egg hunt that's going to be happening. Uh, it's an awesome way for us to just show our community that we love them, being reminded that we don't just uh, serve our community on campus, but it's a way that as we, as people come and to uh, per, uh, participate in an Easter egg hunt, we have an opportunity to show hospitality. Uh, and they'll, at that time, they'll realize this church cares for us. This church loves us. This church is open uh, for us to come and to live life uh, together. And we pray that the gospel will be heard in a way that will bring people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And for those who are already uh, followers of Christ, that same gospel message will remind them of the importance of following Christ and having fellowship with the Lord. And we can be a part of that. And so I would encourage you, if you have not already signed up to participate uh, April the 9th, next Saturday, in our Easter egg hunt, please do so. You can go to our Next Step tab on our website or our Next Step area here on campus. We'd love to get you signed up for that. But what an awesome time for us uh, to show our community uh, that we love them and we care for them. And more than that, Jesus Christ loves them, and he died for them. As we go before the Lord this morning and prepare for... Uh, Hosea chapter 10, uh, one of the passages that keeps, keeps coming to me is in Deuteronomy 6, uh, where Hosea is giving instruction to uh, the people. God gives him this message to share, and it's important for us to realize that God is worthy of all worship and praise. The scripture uh, in Deuteronomy 6 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk with them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care, at least you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. You shall fill him, and you shall serve him, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst, and he is a jealous God. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, as we continue to worship, 
Lord, I pray that we would be reminded not only in our own lives of your faithfulness, but Lord, as we study God's word, specifically in the Old Testament, Lord, that we would see the same God that is faithful today is the same God who was faithful in the past, and you are the same God who will be faithful in the future. But Lord, sometimes we, we forget your faithfulness. Sometimes we take credit for your work. Lord, I pray that not only today, but every day that you give us breath on this earth, Lord, that we will acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. Lord, that we will be reminded that you are the one who gives tremendous blessing, and to you we give all glory and honor, even in the hard times. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that are willing to show and to share and to speak the love of Christ, the faithfulness of our Lord. Lord, that we would begin in our homes. Lord, that you would be central in all things in our homes. And through that, Lord, that you would be central as we leave our homes and we go into our community, as we go to work and school, Lord, that, that the reason why we share is because of you. Lord, so often we relegate times of worship to an event on a Sunday morning. But Lord, would you remind us that worship is not an event. Worship is a way of life. And so Lord, we thank you that you are the great I am. We thank you that you hold us in your hand. Lord, we thank you that in Christ, in Christ and through the Holy Spirit of God, Lord, we are sealed for eternity. So Lord, let our hearts praise you. Let our mouths honor you. Lord, let our minds think about you in all things. Lord, as we present your tithes and our offerings this morning to you, Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've provided to Charleston Baptist Church and not just to this church family, but how we've been able to bless other ministries locally and globally. Lord, we lift up missionaries across the world who are sharing the love of God. Lord, being reminded that, that this life is not the end. We will spend eternity somewhere. Apart from Christ, it'll be eternal separation in hell. But with Christ, it'll be eternal, eternal relationship with you in heaven. Lord, we thank you for the grace of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
ce mois, tu me dis si. Before we open up God's word this morning, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we open up your word this morning, we ask that you would show us and teach us exactly what it is that we need to hear this morning. And Lord, as we unpack your truth, Lord, our great desire is to get to the interpretation that you designed for it, but Lord, that you would show us how we are to apply these truths specifically to our lives. Lord, let us be reminded that your word has one interpretation, but many applications, and our desire is to get to your heart, what you meant to say and how you said it to the people that it was originally given to and to the two people that are here today. Lord, we thank you for the power of the word of God. We thank you for the the fact that God's word is always relevant, that it's always life-changing, that it gives life, that it warns us of destruction. Lord, it points us to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we study Hosea chapter 10, Lord, show us exactly how that works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would open up your Bibles to Hosea 10 this morning, if you're joining with us on campus and you don't have a copy of God's word, I would encourage you to look underneath the seat that you're sitting in or underneath the seat in front of you. There should be a blue Bible there. I'd encourage you to take that Bible, open up to page 843, 843. So we are uh, working our way through uh, the book of Hosea. Uh, We'll take a slight pause on Easter Sunday and then pick it up uh, the week after that. And uh, by God's grace, uh, Pastor Jason will finish it uh, on May the 1st as we look at Hosea 14 on May the 1st. And so that is kind of our are where we're at this morning and where we're going. And we are kind of in the middle of this portion of the book of Hosea where um, it kind of like God's saying the same thing over and over again. As a parent, do you feel like you have to say the same thing over and over again to your children? I mean, it's like constant. Like, why, why do we have to keep saying the same thing over and over again? And it's... And, you go to God's word, you're, you're in Hosea 10, we've been walking through verse by verse, and we're going to hear some of the same uh, thought pattern in Hosea chapter 10, and it's like, why, why do we need to keep talking about the same? We, we are in a position of scripture this morning, uh, and where we've been the past uh, couple weeks is we've moved past really the urgency of the warning of turn from your ways to now the severity of the punishment because of sin, and it's like, really, we got to do another chapter like that. And the question is, why, why does God have to repeat himself, right? Listen, we need reminders all the time. We need to be reminded time and time again of the beauty of God, the sinfulness of man, and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so as we walk through the book of Hosea, specifically chapter 10 this morning, uh, we're going to hear some of the same themes, and, and we're going to draw truths out of those themes. And, and my prayer is that when we get to our takeaways uh, towards the end, and how it applies to us as New Testament Christians today, followers of Christ today, based on the finished work of Christ, we're under the new covenant, praise God, that we will see those truths just be magnified and point us to our need for Christ and our fellowship with the Lord. And that is our heart this morning as we study God's word. So we're going to pick up in Hosea chapter 10. We're going to walk verse by verse uh, through this chapter, and then we'll get our application points, our takeaways uh, at the end. We begin in verse 1. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. And now, on first glance, this sounds like an amazing thing, right? That, That the vine, which is often referred to as Israel, is luxurious. Like, this is, a, this is a great thing. This is a beautiful thing. Until we understand the way the Hebrew brings the verse together. The Hebrew says it like this. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields fruit for its own benefit. So everything that God has given to them, everything that God has blessed them with, instead of using it to worship the Lord, they're using it to continue in sinning. And how do we know that? Because the very next part of the verse says what? The more his fruit increased... The more altars he built, as his country improved, he improved his pillars. And so the blessings that God provided to them, again, God initiates blessing. Instead of that being worship towards the Lord, they began to worship and bring it to themselves. The the beautiful places that were being built, that's the reference to these altars and uh, these uh, pillars, that those things were not worship to God. They were worship to idols. Now that reminds me of kind of where we're at 
in America? How do we make it apply to us today? Uh, God has blessed us mightily. We're not perfect, right? But he has blessed us mightily. But one of the things that he has blessed us with has become an idol for many, specifically Christians. Uh, Think about the American dream, right? The American dream of prosperity and health and wealth and and you set your stage, right? Like, and it changes a little bit. Like back in the day, it was uh, you get married, you have uh, two kids, got to be a boy and a girl, right? And you have a good job and all that stuff. But it transitioned a little bit. Um, now it's pretty much, you know, you go to college, you go to grad school, uh, you have no, you know, your parents pay for everything and, you know, all that other stuff. And then, you know, when you're 40, then you start thinking about living life again, right? And and this idea of an American dream, that if we just get to the American dream, that's why so many people want to come here, by the way. If we just get the American dream, then life is set. So God has blessed us mightily, but we've taken those blessings, instead of turning them to worship towards God, reverence to, to the Lord, we've used those things to benefit ourselves, to benefit our agenda. So we're not immune to this, right? But yet we spend so much time of our lives pursuing that dream versus the desire that God has for his people. And so we're not immune to it. Verse two, their heart is false. That means their hearts are divided and we too can have divided hearts. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. So these places that have been uh, uh, built to, uh, should be built to worship the Lord are now being uh, built to worship uh, other things other than the Lord. And the scripture says, uh, he reminds us that he's not gonna play second to anyone, right? Uh, the phrase there, break down, really is a graphic phrase because it's, it's a picture of a, a, an animal's neck being broken, right? And God is saying, what you should have been doing with your idols, I'm going to step in and I'm going to take care of them. The things that you held on to, the things that you thought brought you security and blessing, those things will be removed. Verse 3, for now they will say, we have no king, for we do not fear the Lord and a king, what could he do for us? And so there, because there's no fear for God, they look to earthly leaders. They look to earthly political parties, if you will, to fix what is broken. And the reality is what? Nobody can fix it. No party can fix it. It's kind of true today, right? We look at the political landscape and the leadership landscape that we have today, and we think there's no way. Nobody's going to make it right. Now, we think they will. But ultimately, we know that it is not true. Because there is no fear for God, the political leaders and political parties have no authority because they have lost their credibility. Would you agree with that today? Lost their credibility. Verse 4, they utter mere words, so there's a lot of talk, right? With empty oaths, they make covenants, so judgment uh, springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. So the people are saying a lot of things, right? Right? They're making agreements, they're making contracts, but because they have no fear for the Lord, they lack integrity, and so it's just words, no action. Their words mean nothing. It reminds me of that good old song by Alabama, right? Down home, down home where they know your name and they treat you like family, down home where a handshake, a a man's good word and a handshake is all you need, right? They're not living in Alabama, right? Same today. The, the idea where it talks about a judgment springing up, it's like all these lawsuits. Because there's a lack of integrity with a man's word, that you have to have lawyers sort out the issues, make judgments on the issues, and kind of like today, right? Lawsuits everywhere. Why? Because people lack integrity. And where this luxuriant vine in verse 1 is now a poisonous weed in verse 4. Not only is there a a breakdown in leadership, but there's also a breakdown in pursuit of the Lord. Verse 5, the inhabitants of Samaria, so that would be the capital in the northern kingdom, uh, tremble for the calves at Bethaven. Remember Bethaven. Uh, It it used to be called Bethel, right, the house of God. But because uh, the house of God was turned into a place of uh, worshiping of idols, it's now Bethaven, which would be the house of wickedness. And, And what is it that they're upset about? What are they trembling for? Scripture goes on, it's people mourn for it. What is the it? It's the idols. It's the golden calf, right? The scripture says, and so do its idolist priests. So these, these, these priests who were supposed to be representing 
uh, the people of God to God are, are they're upset because these false idols are being destroyed. Those who rejoice over it and over its glory, for it has departed from them. The thing itself shall be carried to Assyria. That's the army that's coming to attack them in 722. As a tribute to the great king, Ephraim shall be put to shame and Israel shall uh, be ashamed of his idol. So the thing that they should be mourning over is their idolatrous hearts towards the Lord, Right? But because they have built their lives on the idols, because they have taken the blessings of God for the benefit of themselves, when those things start to be removed, instead of mourning over that and going before the Lord, they're upset because those things are being taken away. It's a reminder to us that uh, oftentimes, if we're not careful, the very blessings that God provides to us can become idols, right? And when God begins to slowly and painfully pull one finger off that at a time with the heart of a desire of repentance when it's finally gone the thing that we cherish the thing that we slaved for the thing that we work so hard for when it's gone we find ourselves getting angry at God God I've done all this for you and this is how you're going to pay me back right and so we're not immune to this we go to verse 7 uh, scripture says Samaria's king shall perish like a twig on the face of the water. So you think about a, a twig that is broken and it's kind of tossed in a stream and it, it's just floating, right? There's no, they have no power. That's what it's saying. The king has no power. The high places of Avon, uh, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. So they adopted these Canaanite places of worship. They adopted these things and those things will be destroyed. And then scripture says thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars. And anytime you see thorn and thistles, it points us back to Genesis 3.18. When sin entered the world, uh, work that is a place of how we can worship the Lord. By the way, we don't worship work, but God has given us the ability to work as a way to worship him. Now it's going to be painful, right? Because sin has entered the world. The scripture talks about thorn and thistle, the land. And they shall say to the mountains. Now this is an interesting phrase. And they shall say to the mountains, cover us and to the hills, fall on us. Now, what is that talking about? Well, that, that same uh, phrase is quoted uh, two other times in the New Testament. Jesus quotes it, uh, and also the Apostle John quotes it. And it's, it, it, again, we're in a place of severity of punishment, severity of judgment. So why are the people crying this out? Well, when Jesus uses this phrase, he uses it in Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 30, and he's prophesying to the people that coming judgment is, the judgment is coming, and he's referring to the fact that Jerusalem will be destroyed. And that's what happened in AD 70. And he says, basically, the, the punishment will be so bad that you would rather be dead than be alive. It's kind of what he's saying here. Now, the Apostle John says it again. And he says it in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 6, referring to the last judgment, the, the final judgment. He's saying that that judgment is going to be so bad that people would rather be dead than alive. And so, again, the severity of the punishment. Hosea chapter 10, verse 9. From the days of Gibeah, you have sinned, O Israel. There they have continued. Shall not the war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? And so remember uh, Gibeah from uh, last week, and I'm not going to rehash it all, but in, if you go to Judges chapter 19 uh, through uh, 21, you have this horrific uh, display of the darkness and the depravity of sin, right? And how uh, that played out. And one of the ways that it played out towards the end was there, wanted, there needed to be retribution for the sin, and so uh, the tribe of Benjamin uh, was attacked and uh, basically wiped out and left only 600 left. And, and the scripture is saying, what, that, that, that wasn't only what happened in the past. That wasn't just an isolated incident, but your, the way that you're living, the, 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 my people, the way that you continue to live your life, you're continuing on just like you did back in Gibeon. And so if war came then, what's, what's stopping war coming again? And that's what's going to happen in 722 B.C. The Assyrian army is going to come in and wipe them out. So this punishment is unavoidable. God says in verse 10, When I please, I will discipline them. A nation shall be gathered against them when they are bound up for the double iniquity. So God is speaking. Who's in control here? God. God says, when I, when I please, when I'm ready. Right? Again, he has been warning. He's been seeking his bride to return from their sin, to repent of their sin. And the scripture says that this double iniquity, what is the double iniquity? Well, the prophet Jeremiah tells us what the double iniquity is. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, it, it refers to uh, forsaking God. That's sin number one. The second sin is what? You're turning to 
idols. You're turning to uh, false gods. And that's what God's people had been doing over and over and over again. And what is God doing? As a, as a loving God, as a faithful God, he's telling them, stop, stop, stop. We get to verse 11. Uh, Ephraim was a trained calf that loved to thresh, and I spared her fair neck. But I will put Ephraim to the yoke. Judah must plow. Jacob must harrow for himself. Now, what's happening here? This is actually a really beautiful verse. Uh, because the scripture is saying that, uh, that, that Israel used to be a trained calf. Now, think about uh, this is an ag- agricultural community. Uh, that's how they lived, right? They, they harvested crop, and when they got the crop, they had, they, the, the crop had to be threshed. In other words, the, the, the grain had a, that hard husk around it, and that husk needed to be broken in order for them to get to what they really needed. And the way that they would do that is they would use animals. Uh, the animals would basically break up uh, the, the husk off, and then they would uh, thresh the, the, the chaff up in the air or the grain up in the air, and they would separate the chaff from the grain. And so what's happening here is uh, Israel, because of their blessing, they, didn't, they were living in a life of comfort. So think about it like this. There, there's no yoke on this animal at this point, right? And so they're freely walking in a circle, if you will, with no restraints, free. All they need to do is put their, their head down, in a sense, and they just continue to walk. And as they walk, what happens with the, the, the harvest? It breaks up properly. And what do they do? They, they just eat. They just eat. It's easy work, if you will. They're, so they're comfortable, right? Why? Because there's been prosperity. There's been uh, peace, in a sense. And now that begins to change. Because they've been living a life of comfort and not giving acknowledgement to the Lord. Remember Deuteronomy 6, the passage I read in, during the offertory that they feel like they're doing these things, not God providing these things. The scripture says that I've spared your fair neck. Now think about it like this. Uh, I used to do uh, landscaping and I own a pool business for, for a long time. And it's a labor job. And so you, you get calluses on your hands, right? Well, then I got an office job. Uh, I, I was a business consultant for AT&T. And what happens with your calluses if you're not still doing manual labor? Oh, they start to you get soft skin, right? I was pushing pins, pushing paper all the time. And one day I had to do a bunch of landscaping at the house. And guess what happened to my hands? I had blisters all over the place, right? Because I forgot what it was like uh, to do that type of labor. And so what's happening here is God is saying, hey, you don't have any calluses on your neck. I've spared you from that type of labor. I have given you freedom to enjoy the blessings of God. But that is going to change. How do we know? The scripture says that you are... You're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to harrow the land. That, that means that you're going to have to prepare the land for the harvest of next year. And that's the worst part of the job, to dig up that hard dirt. And the scripture says not only Israel, the northern kingdom, but also Judah, the southern kingdom. And then he references Jacob. That's the, whole, the entire nation. Like Judah is not going to hear the warning that God is giving to the northern kingdom, and they are going to follow suit. And we know that happens uh, later on in the history of God's people what is God's heart for them? That's the question. Verse 12. He says, sow for yourselves. In other words, invest your life. Plant your life where? In righteousness. What is of God? And the result is what? That you will reap steadfast love, this hested love, this loyal love, this faithful love. Break up your fallow ground. That is the hard ground, the, the numb ground that happens in our hearts, right? We're not, we get callous over time. We get apathetic of the things of God all the time. We get numb to the things of God. And God says, my heart for you is what? That you will soften your heart towards me. For it is time to seek the Lord. And guess what? It's always a good time to seek the Lord. And why is that? That he may come and rain righteousness upon you. What a tremendous joy that God gives us when we seek him. That he rains his righteousness on us. This is God's desire for his people. But what happens? What's the people's response? First part of verse 13. You have plowed iniquity, that is sin. You have reaped injustice, that is pride. You have eaten the fruit of lies, that is deception. The question is why? Why did they plow sin, reap pride, and deception? Second part of verse 13. Because you have trusted in your own way and the multitude of your warriors. So they're trusting in their own self-confidence. They're trusting in their own military might. Verse 14. Therefore, the atonement of war shall arise among your people. So think about that as the, the, the physical, the audible signs of war, right? I love the movie Gladiator, and you got things clanging and all that stuff, and my man, he's doing awesome. But think about 
I think about Ukraine in all honesty. Do you think those sounds are good? That's the picture. That that's what you're going to hear. Now, obviously, that's 2022, but take yourself back. That the sounds of war are not beautiful. And that's what's happening here is God's people are going to be in a place of war. Why? Because they're, they're not depending on the Lord. The scripture says, and all your fortresses shall be destroyed. And then it references as Shalman destroyed Beth Arbel on the day of battle. Now, we don't know exactly what that was, but God's people did. But here's what we do know about this particular war. It was gruesome. How? The scripture says mothers were dashed in pieces with their children. So it was a war that had no mercy at all. Verse 15, thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great evil. At dawn, the king of Israel shall be utterly cut off. That is, the kingdom, the nation of Israel will be stopped. So we get through all this, and we've heard similar language in the past. The question is, what are our takeaways? How is it that we apply God's word in the book of Hosea to New Testament believers today? And that's, that's the beauty of the scripture. In 1 Corinthians 10, it tells us, it tells us why we study God's word. Why specifically study the Old Testament? Because it's there that God gives us instruction, and God also shows us these are the things that you should not be practicing, right? So we, that's why we study God's word. Now, as I've studied uh, Hosea 10, and I think about healthy discipleship, what it means to be a healthy follower of Christ, and using the book of Hosea, specifically chapter 10, how does it apply to me and us as healthy followers of Christ? Uh, the four words jumped out at me. And I'm going to give you those words up front. They're not in the order that we're going to study them, but I want to give them to you right now. Verse 1, the word vine. And you can underline them. You can write them down if you want. Uh, verse 3, the word fear. Verse 11, the word yoke. Verse 12, the word so. All these things point us to uh, the Lord. So the first thing that we want to talk about this morning as a takeaway is we are to submit under the yoke of Christ. Submit under the yoke of Christ. What was the yoke of judgment in the book of Hosea is now a yoke of rest in Christ. And praise God for that. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Where the yoke meant judgment in the book of Hosea is now a place of rest. The, the, the word yoke is talking about submission. What are we submitting to? And the reality is we are yoked to something, believe it or not. For some, we are yoked to our works, right? When you are wor- yoked to your works, that, the scripture says that you, that is a burdened life. That is an, an exhaustive life. When you feel like that you have to perform, that you have to somehow earn your approval before God. When you're yoked under that, there is no rest. It's always more, more, more. It's that performance-driven life. And not only is it you trying to do that, but guess what? We impose those same things on the people around us. It's the story of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 4. It says, they, speaking of the Pharisees, tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay on them people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their fingers. So not only are you absorbing this performance-driven life, but you're also imposing that on the people around you. And God's people are not immune to that. Think about your life for just a minute. How many of us live with that type of yoke? A yoke that I gotta do more. There's more I have to do. It's a burden task. For some, you're not tied to the yoke of works, but you're tied to the yoke of self-centeredness. This is the person who, because they have lost their identity in Christ or misplaced their identity in Christ and their, the meaning that God has put for them that you try to fill the void of life with everything and anything. There's no boundaries. And we see this in Solomon's life. Ecle- Ecclesiastes chapter two, he says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. My heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. He says, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I extended to in doing it And behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So what is the reward of self-centeredness, being yoked to that? Meaningless, vanity. You get to the end of your life, essentially. You look at all that stuff, workaholism, uh, all those relationships, uh, the things that you build, the things that you can buy, all those things that you're yoked under that, that somehow that's going to give you meaning, and you get to the end. 
and you're exhausted. But then there's the yoke of Christ that gives us rest. Being under his weight, his gentleness, his humility, it brings rest to our soul. It's a gospel promise in Christ that he will give rest to your soul. Not only eternal rest, but day-to-day rest. The inner peace that Jesus is with me, that Jesus is my comfort, he is my strength, he is my wisdom, he is my love, and he is my ultimate satisfaction. Do you see why the yoke matters? What yoke are you tied to today? Are you under the yoke of Christ or are you under the yoke of performance or self-centeredness, trying to find meaning in all other areas of life? The second word, vine. In Christ, we are to abide in the vine. In Hosea 10, the vine was fruitless, right? But the vine of Christ has plenty of fruit, bountiful fruit. Jesus says in uh, in John chapter 15, verse 1, He says, I am the true vine, right? Where Israel wasn't the true vine, right? Jesus is the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So Jesus' desire for every follower of Christ today is that we bear the fruit of Christ to reflect him in every area of our life. And guess what? He will stop at nothing to accomplish that. He cleanses you. He lifts you up. He removes the things in your life that get in the way. Our role is to do what? To abide. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me, and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. The word abide means to cling to, to rest in. We're resting in him. We're trusting in him. We're depending on him. We're staying with him. These are relational terms when we think about abiding. Jesus is focused on what? The relationship. That's what matters to him most. And what is he commanding us to do? He's commanding us to be in fellowship with him. It's a reminder to us that if we're not abiding in him, resting in him, we cannot do anything. So when our fellowship isn't right, our lives will not be right. This is why Jesus disciplines us. This is why he continually puts gospel pressure on us because his desire is that the fellowship that we have with him will be right. We abide in him. This is why Jesus goes on to say in John 15, verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so prove to be my disciple. So there's an obedience aspect here, right? There is a correlation between abiding and obedience. In other words, if we're not obeying the Lord, then there's a fellowship issue. There's an abiding issue. But when we are abiding in Christ, guess what's going to follow? Obedience is going to follow. And because of that, he is glorified. The scripture goes on to say in verse uh, 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. But abide in my love. So obedience comes from what? Realizing that the Father loves me, right? And I love him, and... The fruit of that love is what? Is obedience. He goes on to say in verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So it's not first go do, it's first rest in God's love for you. And as God's love for you begins to manifest itself in your heart and you start to grab onto that, then you will have a love for him and part of that love for him produces the right kind of obedience. And why is that important? Verse 11 these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Overflowing joy that the Lord gives us when we abide in him. The, second, uh, the third word, sow, sow to the spirit, sow to the spirit. In Hosea 10, God's people sowed uh, to the flesh and it brought destruction. We in Christ can sow to the spirit, which brings life. Paul speaks of this in Galatians 6, uh, verse 7 through 9. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Do not be deceived. Is talking about uh, this idea that, that sowing to the flesh will not expose itself at some point, right? We have to realize that, that the sowing process takes time, either good or bad, right? So if we're sowing to the flesh, it might not expose itself tomorrow, but eventually it will, just like sowing to the Spirit. It takes time for the Spirit of God to begin to manifest itself in your life. And the Scripture is going to tell us in verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh... Will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit 
will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And so this process of sowing and reaping is true, that what you sow, you will ultimately reap. And it's a reminder to us that sometimes we get discouraged in that process, right? You, you submit yourself to the Lord because you want to reap uh, the Spirit, the righteousness of the Spirit, and a week goes by and you find yourself not seeing that fruit for whatever reason and you get discouraged, right? Anybody ever been there? Yes. And the Scripture says what? Here's the encouragement, verse 9, and let none of us grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So it's a great reminder that there is, it takes time, it's a process, right? Why do we need to walk in the Spirit? Uh, Verse 16 of Galatians 5 says, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So are they in agreement? Is the flesh and the Spirit in agreement? No. That's why we have to sow to the Spirit. They're at war at one, with one another. And who wins every time? Ultimately, the Spirit's going to win, right? But our role is to what? To submit to Him. So what are, uh, the, what are the works of the flesh? That's what he says in verse 19. We'll go through these real quickly because I want you to examine your life today. He says, now the works of the flesh, they're evident, meaning they can be seen, right? And there's a warning sign that's lit up on your dashboard when these things are seen, that you're walking, you're sowing to the wrong thing, right? What are those things? He talks about sexual sin, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. He talks about sins related to worship, idolatry, sorcery. He talks about relational sins, and this is the biggest category, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. He talks about sins of indulgence, drunkenness, orgies, and all things like these. And so when you think about your life today, and you think about the fruit of the flesh, if you will, those are warning signs that you're sowing to the wrong thing. You're sowing to the flesh, not to the spirit. Verse 21, the scripture says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's important. The word do talks about habitual lifestyle. That means as Christians, are, are we immune from those sins that we just mentioned? No, we're not immune to those things. Is it possible that we can commit those sins as a follower of Christ? Absolutely possible. The question is, is that our habitual lifestyle? If that is our habitual lifestyle, it's an indicator that what? We haven't truly been saved. Why? Because in Christ, we are a new creation. In Christ, we have the power of God who resides in us. And he has given us the ability to express, to reflect the fruit of the Spirit. And what is that? Verse 22, it is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 24, and those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh which is passions and desires. The beauty is it's Christ in me, right? It's not me trying to muster up enough strength to make those things happen, right? If I yoke myself under the teaching of Christ, and I abide in Christ, guess what's going to happen? The fruit of Christ is going to exhibit itself. Don't give up. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So it reminds us that there is a work to it, right? Christianity is not passive. It's not just sit back and recline and, okay, God, do what you do. No, we have an active part in our relationship with the Lord, our fellowship with the Lord, and our healthy discipleship towards the Lord. And that brings us to the last thing, fear. Work out your own salvation with fear. Where there was no fear in Hosea chapter 10, as followers of Christ today, we should have a gospel fear. How do we know that? Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's a beautiful verse. Two, those two verses are amazing. And the picture is in Philippi, you had these uh, silver mines that were underneath the ground. So you had a lot of value that was there, right? But what had to happen? It had to be worked out of the ground, right? And so what the scripture is reminding us is the gospel is beautiful in you. Now it has to be worked out of you, right? So there is a work and we work by, uh, by grace through faith, right? We're putting our faith in Christ. We're submitting to his ways. And so when we talk about fear, there's multiple aspects of fear. We're not living in fear thinking that God is going to abandon us. I messed up. God's going to cut the relationship. That is not the case. 
The new covenant does not allow that. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. So that's not the fear that the scripture is speaking of. So what is that fear? It's fear living in a way dishonoring the Lord. That there's such a reverence towards God that God, I don't want to do anything that dishonors your holy name. The other part of fear is, is I stand in awe. Praise God, I'm not the man I used to be, right? I stand in awe of the power of God. And when I meet with other followers of Christ and I see God's gracious hand on them, I stand in awe. Why? Because God can only do that. And not only that, that fear brings assurance. Assurance that God will finish what he started. Philippians 1 verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. It's a reminder to us that in Christ, everything changes. Now I can submit under the yoke of Christ. I can abide in Jesus, the vine, and I can sow to the Spirit, and I can work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. As the worship team comes up, as we bring our time to a response, I hope you see the gospel connections in Hosea 10 with those four words. Praise be to God, he is the true vine. Praise be to God, he is the one that gives us a yoke that not, doesn't bring exhaustion, but brings rest. Praise be to God that I no longer have to sow to my flesh, but because of the spirit of God that lives in me, I can sow to the spirit. And praise be to God, I can work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, not in any way thinking that I'm gonna lose my salvation, but living in such a way that I don't want to dishonor my Lord, my King, and that I can stand in awe of his handiwork, the power of Christ in me, and I can be assured that he will complete what he started. So as we worship the Lord in our response song, this has been primarily to believers this morning. Do you find yourself being yoked to Christ today? Or are you yoked to performance or self-gratification? Do you find yourself... Uh, abiding in the vine, or are you trying to live life on your own? Do you find yourself today sowing to the Spirit, or do you find yourself sowing to the flesh? Remember Paul said the works are evident. And do you find yourself today working out your own salvation in fear by grace through faith? As we stand and sing this time of response, I pray that the Lord would press on you your place of decision today. Maybe for you, it's first time profession of faith in the finished work of Christ. Maybe for you, as a follower of Christ, you realize, you know what? I'm, I'm exhibiting some of the same things in Hosea's day. And God has given me warning. God has graciously disciplined me. And now is the time. Today is the day to return to him and enjoy the freedom that Christ gives me. Let us stand and sing to the Lord. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me all oh, his love for me. All oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his rage runs While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me, yes he
Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for being here today. I know that was a lot to kind of digest, and I would just encourage you uh, to spend time in God's Word this morning. Maybe go through those takeaways and look at the beauty of why uh, the gospel is so important to us and why uh, we trust not just in salvation at the moment of forgiveness of sin, but each and every day we trust in the finished work of Christ. Listen, there is no greater yoke that you can be under than the yoke of Christ. There's no greater vine that you can attach yourself to than abiding in Jesus. There's no greater place that you could sow than sowing to the Spirit. And there's no greater uh, place in the blessing of fear, gospel fear, fearing the Lord, not because he will abandon us, but fearing him because he is worthy of praise and honor and that I want and you want every aspect of your life to show tremendous worship towards him with the assurance that he will complete what he started. And we stand in awe. We have front row seats, if you will. Not to a game tomorrow night, but we have front row seats to what God is doing in and through his people. Praise God. At this time, I just want to bring before you uh, someone that has joined our faith fellowship this morning, uh, Bobby Lorenz. And uh, just a tremendous blessing to our church family already. And I pray that this would be an opportunity uh, for us to continue to grow as healthy as the disciples together. And so if you would affirm uh, Bobby's decision uh, to join our faith fellowship here at Charleston Baptist Church, if you would say amen. 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 Praise be to God. Let us pray together. Lord, as we leave our time together, uh, Lord, I pray that the, the truths of the gospel will go before us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to just hear from you. Lord, we pray that as we study God's word, Lord, as you reveal those areas in our life uh, that may not uh, be in tune to the word of the Lord in a way that it needs to, Lord, that you would bring about uh, conviction and a place of repentance, Lord, that we would have a renewed trust in the gospel. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the church. We thank you that we can grow together uh, through the good and the bad, Lord, the good times and the hard times. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing here at Charleston Baptist Church. We thank you what you're doing in and through your people. Lord, as we uh, gear towards uh, the next several weeks in April, Lord, uh, I pray that, that we would just want to see the harvest, Lord, that you would provide the laborers necessary for the harvest. Lord, I believe God's people are ready, are ready uh, to share the gospel, to live out the gospel. But Lord, be, remind us every day that we cannot do it in our own strength. And Lord, where we have failed, Lord, let us turn to you quickly with hearts of humility and submission towards your ways, Lord, that uh, the love of Christ would go through us. Lord, we thank you for uh, the gospel opportunities that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Y'all have a blessed day.